alumni of university who played a key role in uh, breaking Enigma. Uh, this year, dear, unfortunately, we have to do organize that in online, I hope, uh, exceptionally. Uh, I have great honor to invite you to the lecture entitled Semi-Algebraic Set of Integer Points, which will be given by Professor Ginter Zickler, President of Rye University of Berlin. I warmly welcome Professor Ziegler and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to ask His Magnificence Professor Michał Banaszak, Vice Rector of Adam Mickiewicz University, for some opening words on behalf of new university authorities. Please, Professor. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor Dyszkowski, for, for inviting me for this uh, interesting and, and event. It's both pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, and to welcome Professor Ziegler at our university. Uh, from what I learned, you have a, a long history of collaboration, but I hope this collaboration will, will develop even further and will bring us new fruits in, in research and, and collaboration. Well, thank you very much. And, um, and, 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 and I think and now I'm looking forward to, to listening to the, to the lecture. So I'm giving um, so Professor Dyszkowski uh, thank you very much again for, for this uh, wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you for kind words. Uh, I would like briefly present show bio of uh, our honorable guest. Uh, Professor Ziegler started his studies at LMU Munich. He received his PhD in mathematics uh, at MIT in 1987. Since 1995, he has been professor of mathematics at Technische Universität Berlin and science the 2011 at Freie University of Berlin, where science 2018, he served as president. Uh, he is a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities, the German National Academy Leopoldina, and the German Academy of Engineering Sciences. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, have been, uh, has been, he ha was president of the German Mathematical Society. He has received numerous awards, including DFG Leibniz Prize and ERC Advance Grant, the Communicator Awards and the Berlin Science Prize of the Governing Mayor of Berlin. In mathematics, he deals with the aspect of discrete geometry, especially the theory of polyhedra, with algebraic and topological methods in combinatonics and with the problems of optimization. He is committed to promoting a diverse and lively public image of mathematics. Uh, he was an uh, initiator of the Year of Mathematics in 2008 and currently continues his promotional work, among others, directing DMV Media Bureau of Mathematics. Uh, Professor Ziegler has published numerous essays and books, among which proofs of the book was co-authored with Martin Eigner, and translated into 14 languages. The book is dedicated to the mathematician Paul Erdes and contain 32 theorems related to the broad range of mathematics fields. Uh, before, uh, before we start, uh, I got a few technical information. Um, questions can be asked during the lecture via chat. And after the lecture uh, via Q&A function or by voice, after a notification of desire to speak by a right hand function. I think we can move uh, on to the main part of our meeting. Dear professor, please give us the lecture. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation for this lecture. Thank you very much for setting all of this up in these difficult times in a really nice way. Um, I have um, here my um, slides and I'll of course also have to get used to doing this and doing this presentation in this way. It's a great pleasure to have the chance um, to talk about semi-algebraic sets of integer points. So today I'm here not as university president, but really as a mathematician although the topic and the things I want to talk about uh, you can view as a mathematics and geometry thing uh, but you can equally well see this as a question of computer science and really data analysis and so I hope that from these various um, different perspectives that I will connect um, 
you can um, you can enjoy this in in various different ways. Um, what I will um, present this also includes joint work with actually three um, uh, previous graduate students. One of them is Moritz Fersching, who is now with Google in, in Zurich, uh, Hannah Schöberg, who graduated this year, and Philipp Brinkmann, um, who is also in industry now, um, and his work will also uh, show up briefly. So um, a lot of people have looked into these things. Um, I also want to present this to you because on the one hand, it's very visual. On the other hand, because there's um, open questions and interesting questions, and also because it has some connections even with the Polish heroes that we celebrate also with this lecture uh, today. You will see. So here is a, a plan for the lecture where um, the entry will be that we look at sets of points actually in the plane um, and look at what do we mean by a set of points is simple or complicated. And then I will um, sketch the problem that I'm motivated from coming from discrete geometry, the effector problem. And then we look at some answers. And uh, there's always the question, is this a simple answer? Is this a complicated answer? What do we mean by that? And in the end, the answer will be that, or one possible answer is that what I call a semi-algebraic set of points is a simple answer and then we will see that life is not simple and not all answers even for the geometry problem i come from um, are simple and then we go into how to establish that and there will be of course final thoughts and in the end there will be open problems it's not all solved so that's what it is so the game we do is uh, that i show you a set of points um, in the examples I give you, this will be integer points, um, which means points in the plane, um, which have integer coordinates. And you try and describe this set to me, and, um, and uh, you will see that's uh, sort of tricky. And we, we look at whether that's a simple or a complicated set. So here's the first example. Um, which is um, we have a coordinate system um, so the big black dots are the points that are in the set and the little uh, black dots just indicate that these points are not in the set um, i should also say that we always look at really infinite sets of points so this is not only all the points which have coordinates at most 15 but somehow it continues out there that also means that we somehow have to extrapolate and we have to get an intuitive meaning of what we are really talking about. And in this case, um, there's a rather simple description which says that we are just looking at all the integer points between these two lines. One of them is marked red, the other one is blue. Of course, we could um, write down equations for these lines, but let's not do that for the moment. Um, I hope we would all agree that this is a simple set of points, and it's simple because it has a simple description by two inequalities, which say that this should be above or on the blue line and below or um, on the red line, and that's all the points we take and the others we don't take. So that's a simple answer. Here is a second example. Um, again, integer points, again, an infinite set that comes out of some problem that I will show you in a few seconds or minutes. Um, and um, we might agree that this looks quite a bit more complicated. There's somehow holes in there, like clear there's something missing in there. Um, here we would say that this looks not connected, whatever that means, if we look at integer points in the plane. And um, so what is this? And the first answer is that you can't really tell just from a picture. Uh, you need more data. And the second answer is that in this case we can, so where this comes from, this does come with a reasonably simple description which says that we are talking here about 
all the points above or on the blue line and all the points on or below the red line which is not really a line but it's a parabola and um, also there is four exceptions which are marked here so there's four points that are not in there so again the question is this simple or complicated and i would say in the end this is simple because this has the same type of description um, it's a bit more complicated and catered than the first one, but this is all the integer points on or above the blue line, below or on the red line, and with four exceptions. So that's a finite algebraic description, if you want, and in that sense, this is easy. So here's a third type of uh, set that shows up in these geometry problems I want to talk about. Um, Again, you look at this for a while and perhaps you notice that this is nice and symmetric with respect to the uh, diagonal line. Um, you also see that there's holes. You also see that somehow it doesn't look uh, connected. So what's going on here? And what's going on is that, again, this has a reasonably um simple description but um, um so it's everything or below the blue curve everything on or above the red curve and there is a finite number of exceptions that's all the little black dots that are within the two curves but also something else has happened namely that these curves here um they are not algebraic curves anymore. This is not a line or a, a parabola or something like that, but it's a zigzag line. And what you again, you can see from what I show you is that there will be the next dent over there and so on. And in the end, there will be infinitely many dents. So this is not an algebraic line. And in a certain sense, this doesn't have a simple description or in another sense, it does have a description, but the description is one step more complicated. So what do we see? We see that we look at different point sets in the plane and there's different ways to describe them, but uh, these ways also give us the chance to say that some things are complicated or not so complicated. Now, Here's my fourth and last example in this um, opening um, slideshow. And now something else has come, has changed, which you might um, think is dramatic, namely that also I don't know how to describe the set and I don't understand the set. Um, there's the integer points to the left side uh, of this dashed line where you can note two things. One is that we are only taking every second point here. Um, so the description for that would be that for all these points, um, the sum of the two coordinates is even, or the difference, or whatever you want to describe it. Or if one is odd, then the other one is odd. And if one is even, then the other is even. So this is not really a subset of all the integer points, but it's a subset of all the integer points with sum of coordinates equals even. And then there's the points on the left side of this dotted line, which you can certainly describe in such a way. And then there's the dots on the right side where um, the black part is what it is. And these gray dots is the ones where I can tell you whether what they are really in the set. And so if I can't tell you what points are in the set, then I probably also can't tell you whether the set is um, simple or complicated. So we plainly don't know. And if we do this type of sort of data analysis for um, point sets that come from ge geometry problems, then uh, of course, there's always a question to what extent do we understand a set of points in the plane? And we see here there's different levels of understanding. There's the sets that are simple and have a simple description. 
There's the sets that are more complicated, but still can, uh, can be described, but perhaps they cannot be described in a simple way. And then there's the things that we don't understand. Um, so um, listening to myself, I think of this former defense minister from the USA, Donald Rumsfeld, who was famous for this conference where he started saying out there's things we understand and there's things we don't understand, there's things we understand that we understand them and there's things that we don't understand that we don't understand them and so on. So this Rumsfeld press conference is something you can look up. There's even a wonderful um, recording of that press conference for soprano and uh, piano, but this is not our topic for today. So um, let me rather slip to um, where this all comes from. So for this example here, um, this is just an approximate description where we in the end we see it doesn't work out. So all the integer points we talk about, have even some of coordinates, they are above the fat blue line, but it's not true that they're all below the dashed blue line. And here there's lots of things we don't know and where we know that we don't know them. Anyway, now this was points in the plane. Now I want to switch to a problem in geometry, uh, particular in the theory of polyhedra or since I'm interested in, in polyhedra in all dimensions, convex polyhedra, we call them polytopes. And we ask, what's the f vectors of polytopes? And the first answer will be, this is integer points somewhere. And the second answer will be, uh, we really want to understand what these point sets look like. So here's a definition. If I talk about a d-polytope, this is a d-dimensional convex polytope in d-dimensional space. Think of a cube or think of, if you want to be uh, daring, think of a four-dimensional cube. Um, so d would be four. And the f vector just counts how many vertices, edges, and so on and faces this object has. So that's what they call fi is the number of i-dimensional faces. So f0 is the number of vertices. And then we collect the data. And here is our daring example, the four-dimensional cube, um, which uh, in this case, just from the picture, so that's a three-dimensional representation of the four-dimensional cube, of course, but it's good enough to really count the data. And you can say F0 is the number of vertices is 16. And F1 is the number of edges. Um, and the double counting at every vertex, there's four edges. Every edge connects two vertices. So from that, you get that the number of edges is 32. And so on, if you connect the, the dots, so to speak, then we have 16 vertices, 32 edges, 24 two-dimensional faces, which uh, is squares, and eight facets of the four cube, which are three-dimensional cubes. So this is one example of an f vector. And I really want to think of this as an integer point, in this case, not in the, uh, in the plane, but in four-dimensional space. And um, this is one example, but what we really want to understand is the num number of, is the set of all f vectors of d dimensional polytopes for some d, where um, if d equals 2, this will be just a set which consists of 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6. So this will be a very simple set of integer points in the plane. But if d is 3 or 4 or 5, then this clearly becomes more complicated. So here is the f vector problem. Um, the f vector problem says, given some d, describe the set of the f vectors of convex d-dimensional pol polytopes. And this means describe a certain set of integer points in d-dimensional space for this d. So this is a set of integer points. And what does describe mean? Um, 
Well, this means we want to have criteria that tell us whether a vector is an f vector or not. Right? Um, um, of course, it would be nice to have a simple description or characterization of the set of all f vectors. So the question is, what kind of descriptions does this set have? Um, clearly, this is an infinite set of integer points. And just to show you that even find this criterion for a single example isn't so easy. Here's one where I would really like to know the answer. Is there, is this thing an f vector? Um, that is, is there a four dimensional polytope? which has 1,000 um, vertices and 1,000 facets and 10,000 edges and 10,000 two faces. And the answer is, um, I don't know. And I, I would perhaps guess that this exists, but then I would really know how to construct it or how to find it or how to show that this exists. So I don't know and I know that I don't know. So what do we know about this effector problem? This has been um, studied in uh, polytope theory in the 20th century from the beginning to the end. And some of the greatest successes in polytope theory really give contributions to that. And the first um, major contribution was by Ernst Steinitz. Um, um, I'll say something about him in a second, and who in 1906 published a little paper where he really described f of p3. So he told us when is a set uh, of integer triples, um, and sorry, when is an integer triple an f vector of a three-dimensional polytope. So that's what Steinitz did. And um, the next step then was that Branko Grünbaum in the 1960s did two things. On the one hand, he noted that there is only one equation satisfied by the effectors of d-dimensional polytopes, at least one linear equation, namely the Euler equation, or if you want the Euler-Poincaré equation, so for the three-dimensional case, this is just number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces equals two. And Grünbaum proved that's the only equation um, satisfied by d-dimensional polytopes. And Grünbaum also started and say, well, it's so complicated to understand, uh, in this case, d minus, and d minus one-dimensional set in d-dimensional space. Let's look at the two-dimensional projections. And so this gives you pictures like this one here, and um, that's exactly where the examples come from that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. So um, now the third thing, 1980s, um, and this is really a major part in polytope theory, is the so-called G theorem, which characterizes the F vectors of all polytopes which are simplicial where simplicial means that all the faces are simplices. So the octahedron is an example of a simplicial polytope and the cube isn't because the cube has quadrilateral faces and not triangle faces. And um, this characterizes, we will get there, the characterization is complicated in a certain sense, but the amazing thing is really that this question has an answer that there is a way to characterize the f vectors of simplicial polytopes in all dimensions in a somehow unified way. Okay. Um, let me just mention that um, since we are in these complicated times where there's also heroes around, in this lecture I want to also show and mention to some of my mathematical heroes that show up. And the first one is Ernst Steinitz, who I already mentioned for his little lemma from 1906. And Ernst Steinitz, if you go to Wikipedia, the German page at least says that he was a German mathematician. Um, but actually, he was born in Katowice, Katowice, I guess, in Polish in uh, 1871. Um, 
he started studying in Breslau, Wroclaw, and then he did his habilitation in Berlin at Technische Hochschule Charlottenburg, which is now um, Technische Universität Berlin. So he's a German Polish uh, mathematician. Um, he's also Jewish. Um, his wife died in Treblinka um, in the Holocaust. So this is also um, German history, of course, and German Polish history. Um, he died, uh, Steinitz died in 1928. Um, this other hero that shows up here is Branko Grünbaum, who is originally from Yugoslavia, um, um, was then in Israel and then in Washington, Seattle. And Branko Grünbaum died just two years ago. And this is the cover of the original edition of his book on convex polytopes, which really defines um, polytope theory. It's a book from 1967. Um, I had the honor to work on the second edition from that, but um, Branko Grünbaum shows up also in lots of things that we do um, in the following. So let's look at answers. And the answers that we have for sets of F vectors of polytopes, um, the first ones are simple in this well-defined way. And here's the first one. And um, another topic that we can look at is, of course, how do we do pictures? First, we need pictures. I mean, I'm a geometer. I need pictures. And here's the picture of um, the F vectors of three-dimensional polytopes. Um, um, actually, the picture is not from Steinitz's paper, but it's from Grünbaum's book. And um, if you read this, he has some letters there. Here's T3. That's the tetrahedron which has four vertices and four edges. And then here on this lower edge, he has S's. And this S says that this is an F vector of a uh, um, simple polytope. And the simple polytopes are the ones where all the vertices have degree three. And I guess six vertices and five faces. This would be the F vector of a triangular prism. Whereas the S's on this edge here are for simplicial, that's the ones where all the faces are triangles. So this one here would be the F vector of a polytope with five vertices and six uh, faces. And this would be the bipyramid over a triangle. So there's the simple polytopes one can describe. The P's in the middle are for pyramids. So this would be a pyramid over a square, the pyramid over a pentagon, and so on. So this is um, Grünbaum's picture of Steinitz's answer for dimension three. This would be my picture for the same thing. And we have this description that we say, well, it's all the integer points between the simplicial polytopes or their effectors and the simple polytopes and their effectors. So that's the red and the blue lines. And then we take everything in between. And the purple point is for the tetrahedron which is simple and simplicial. And that was the picture answer. Here is the algebraic answer, which says we are looking at the F vectors of three-dimensional polytopes. It's all the integer triples, which satisfy the Euler equation and two inequalities. And I interpret this inequalities as saying, this is the maximum number of faces is given by simplicial polytopes and the maximal number of vertices for a given number of faces is given by the simple polytopes. And this would be a simple answer with one equation and two linear inequality. So that's Steinitz's lemma, which you could take as an exercise to prove. Now it gets more complicated and we look at the pairs of now we go for four-dimensional polytopes, and so we have a three-dimensional set, which is hard to understand. But here's the projection, which just says, let's look at only number of vertices and number of facets. And again, this is Grünbaum's picture from his book, um, figure 1041. And here would be my um, computer graphics picture uh, for the same thing. Um, and again, I would say this is a simple answer. 
because the simple answer says that it's all the integer points between two, in this case, quadratic inequalities, and there's actually still one linear inequality. If I go back, um, uh, <laughs> to have a correct answer, if you think of these two parabolas, they will go down and um, in the end there would be some negative integers which also give you solutions to the system. For example, 0, 0 would be a solution of this system, but of course not satisfy this inequality. So this is the description um, of this two-dimensional infinite set of integer points, and I would say this is a simple description. So, um, instead of number of vertices and number of fa facets, let's look at number of vertices and number of edges. And again, here is Grünbaum's picture, um, which is um, also shifted from the usual coordinate systems that we would do. Um, here is sort of the answer in um, usual coordinate system. And again, you will recognize this from earlier in my lecture. It's just all the um, pairs F0, F1 above the blue line, below the red parabola, and with four exceptions. And again, I would say this is a simple answer. And simple here means you can write it down in very simple formula. So we have three inequalities here, three li uh, two linear ones, and one is quadratic. And then we still have to throw out these four points. Um, that's what makes proofs complicated, because in the end, you have to show that there is no four-dimensional polytope, which has six vertices and 12 edges, um, is a fact, can be verified. Geometers have worked on that. Uh, for us and for me here, this is still a reasonably simple answer. Now, Grunbaum did them all with collaborators and students. So this one is Barnett and Ray, 1973. A few years later, this is from the years when one still did papers in with typewriter, as you can see. And this was definitely a huge amount of work to get this done. Um, here's computer graphics. Um, and here's the algebraic answer. And now you see things get more complicated and it gets a mess. And indeed, if you look at the original publications, there's also then some typos in there which need to be corrected at some point. But still in the way I would describe it, this is a simple answer. Um, it's all the integer points which have a linear inequality. Um, this is a quadratic inequality. This is also a quadratic inequality. This says that all the points on a certain parabola are forbidden, and then there's 10 more points that are forbidden. So the structure is this is still a simple answer with algebraic conditions, but it gets more complicated, and it also shows why people needed a few more years to uh, work this out. But they did it. Now, of course, one can go on. We will stop pretty soon. The next thing would be to look at five-dimensional polytopes. And this is very recent work. And there was a preprint by Kuzu Noki and Murai, 19, um, sorry, 2017, um, where they um, had this table in there. Uh, let's better look in the published version from 2019, where they have such a picture. and. Um, what do we learn from that? A, it can be done, and B, it's still describing point sets of integer points in similar kinds of conditions. Um, you can work it out, and so this would be the picture. So in this case, there's two um, linear lines missing, and um, there's some inequalities, and there's some exceptions. It can be done. And indeed, if it can be done, then it's sometimes even done by several teams. In this case, I think in February 2017, there was the paper or the preprint by Kuzunoki and Murai. And two weeks later, there was a preprint by three other authors, which actually did a bit more, but also got the same result. 
getting the same result, of course, is also comforting because that shows that one's on the right track and that people are working with a certain precision and not making mistakes. Um, that's also good to know. Now, um, let's switch gears. And um, let's try and describe what we have seen. And what we've seen is that the answers are still reasonably simple and structured. And I want to describe what simple and structured means. So the question is, do all these effector sets, or in this case, we've looked at two-dimensional projections, do they all have a simple structure? And in the examples I've shown you and where people have worked this out, um, it's always sort of everything between some upper and lower bounds, perhaps with some curves that have to be thrown out and some points that have to be thrown out, but it has a finite description. Um, so in short, can all these sets be described by finitely many polynomial conditions? That's the question. And if you want to formalize it, are these all these sets that show up there as answers for this geometry problem? Are they all integer points? Are they all of the form, all the integer points in a semi-algebraic set? So we should say what that is. Um, it, it's uh, all the integer points in a semi-algebraic set defined over Z, so that it just means we look at polynomials with integer coefficients. And um, semi-algebraic uh, means uh, we have a finite number of such equations and inequalities. Um, and I want to have this definition here. And um, it turns out that semi-algebraic sets have been studied in um, geometry and topology a lot over the last century, where the main theorem and the main deep first theorem is due to Alfred Tarski. We will meet him in a second. Um, but somehow uh, people haven't really looked at what I present to you here. So I've never found really a substantial paper about semi-algebraic sets of integer points um, the way I've just defined them here. And I think that's an interesting structure and that's something that has to be understood. And with this lecture, I want to show you some observations and results we have there. So here's the first lemma. Every finite set is semi-algebraic. Uh, we don't want to do proofs here. Um, um, because that's not what you do in this sort of a lecture, but it's, it's not hard. Uh, a finite set is always semi-algebraic. Um, the second thing says that the complement of a semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic. So if we take all the integer points in the plane with a few exceptions, that's also semi-algebraic. Again, exercise or lemma. Finite unions and intersections are semi-algebraic. That's a very important observation. And that, that's where the semi comes from. People would look at algebraic sets as what you can define with polynomial equations or perhaps inequalities in the reals. But semi-algebraic means you can also take unions and intersections. And that gives you a huge amount of possibilities and variety in what these things look like. And um, this is just a technical observation, which says if you have a semi-algebraic set and intersect it with um, something else, then again, so um, this is an intersection of a semi-algebraic set of integer points with a semi-algebraic set of reals. The intersection is again a semi-algebraic set of integer points. You don't even need to prove that. You just have to sort of uh, work through the definitions to get that. So this is simple lemmas. Um, here's another very simple lemma, but one that we will need and use, uh, which says that when really, that's the one dimensional case. We look at a line, so just uh, the, the integers, 
And when is a subset of the integer semi-algebraic? Answer, if this is a finite union of intervals. And the finite is important there. And I guess we all know what we mean by an interval of integers. So three, four, five, six would be an interval of integers or all the integers 10 and higher would be an interval, but one, three, five would not be an interval. So that's the one dimensional case. This is again, easy. Um, I think we don't want to do proofs, but there's nothing deep in there. Um, as an example, this means the natural numbers is a semi-algebraic set of integers because that's everything larger equals one or everything larger equals zero, depending on your definition of the natural numbers. Um, the integers without zero is also semi-algebraic, but the even integers is not semi-algebraic because you cannot describe them by, um, by a finite number of, um, of polynomial conditions or as a finite union of, um, of things, of intervals. Now, um, here comes now a very important example, just to understand what's going on there. And the example is we look at all the integer points where x equals 2y. So this is definitely a semi-algebraic set of the integer grid, because it's given by one linear equation. But the projection to the first coordinate, so what x's are there such that x is 2y for some y, well, this is a very simple description of the even integers. And so this means we have a semi-algebraic subset um, of the integers and the projection to the first coordinate is not semi-algebraic. Very interesting, important observation. Um, projections are, projections create complexity, projections are a mess. Now, corollary, there are projections of semi-algebraic sets of integer points, which are not semi-algebraic sets of integer points. And here we hit um, a really hard rock. Um, there is a theorem known as the MRDP theorem, because it's due to Putnam, Davis, Robinson, and Makiasiewicz. Um, it comes from the solution of Hilbert's 10th problem. So this is one of the central achievements of last century's mathematics. Um, people count this as logic, um, but you could also count it as number theory. And this says that the projections of semi-algebraic sets of integer points are exactly the Diophantine subjects, uh, subsets of integers grid. And this is the ones that you can exactly recursively enumerate. So this is deep things in computer science from the times when there weren't even uh, computers, at least in the beginning. And this um, describes what you can enumerate and what you cannot um, enumerate um, theoretically on a computer. So, um, just to recap what that means for us, it says semi-algebraic sets of integer points as I defined them is a harmless concept, concept, but the projections of these, the coordinate projections, they are reasonably complicated and they're exactly what's described in the context of Hilbert's 10th problem and the sets that can be enumerated and of course, the deep thing of Hilbert's 10th problem to the answer is that there's integer sets that you cannot enumerate in an efficient way. So again, here's um, heroes of 20th century mathematics. One of them is Yuri Matyasevich, who had a key contribution there, actually with his doctoral thesis age 22. Um, which was a main part of the solution of this problem and actually the final part of the solution of Hilbert's 10th problem. And the other one is Julia Robinson, um, 1919 to 1985, who is also a woman pioneer in mathematics. There's an amazing movie that I can recommend by about the 
solution of Hilbert's tenth problem, and also uh, Matyasiewicz and Robinson and their collaboration. It's all in there. So for us, this also marks we are really in central parts of 20th century mathematics with these concepts. So what uh, can we say for the little problems? I was starting out that the first one says that the set of f vectors of d-dimensional polytopes is recursively enumerable and hence Diophantine. So the recursively enumerate we can work out and the hence Diophantine means it has an algebraic description as a projection of a semi-algebraic set of integers. That part is really then the MDP um, R um, theorem. And in this case, the proof that really the sets of F vectors of D polytopes can be described with algebraic conditions and projections is something you get from Tarski's work, uh, which say that semi-algebraic sets can be understood. And then Grunbaum used this to say polytopes can be understood because basically we can enumerate the combinatorial types and for every single one then Tarski tells us that we can find whether there is a polytope. This is big things and then we combine with the MRDP theorem by Matyasevich and Robinson and collaborators. So just to have the heroes here on this slide, um, Alfred Tarski, again a Polish mathematician and logician, um, who proved that you can um, algorithmically get hold of um, semi-algebraic sets of reals, and Alan Turing, who connected Tarski's work with decision problems. And Turing, of course, I also love to mention here because um, he is sort of the central person for the British efforts to work on the Enigma and decode and the Enigma. And of course, today we are also celebrating the Polish uh, efforts and successes um, on the same problems and on the same machines. Um, so this is heroes of logic, mathematics and computer science. Now, um, Here's the problem that I want to answer for you today as sort of the upshot of my lecture. We look at the F vectors of d-dimensional polytopes and we want to know, is this a semi-algebraic set of integers for each d at least two? Um, so in short, and does this geometry problem have a simple answer? And for d equals 2, this is really too simple to mention, but for dimensions 3, Steinitz's lemma says the answer is yes for three-dimensional polytopes or polyhedra. Um, for dimension 4, um, I call this an observation with quotation marks, which says the set of f vectors of four-dimensional polytopes looks complicated. I think it's a mess. And I would love to be able to prove that it's a mess. So here's a picture from my paper with Philip Brinkmann, 2016. So this is trying to write down, um, this is a certain projection of the, this three-dimensional set in four-dimensional space. And it looks like up there that really is a mess and doesn't only look like a mess. But that's the picture that I've shown you before in some other representation. So here's what we can prove. And the first thing we look at is uh, the pairs of F1 and F2 for four-dimensional polytopes. In this case, um, I show you this because here we know the answer and then we can look for the question. And this is Barnett, again, a student of Grunbaum, 1974. Um, who described this completely. I've shown you this picture before, and this is where this zigzag thing happens. And here is Barnett's answer with some corrections. Um, and this says the set of pairs we look at, these integer points in the plane, can be described 
rather explicitly, um, but uh, this is not an algebraic description because here you have to round up. And so in that case, um, this is not a description as a semi-algebraic set of integer points. Now, little exercise, if I give you an extra variable, an extra integer variable, then you can describe this as a projection of a three-dimensional integer set, which is semi-algebraic, but the two-dimensional projection doesn't look so. There's this zigzag in there and this rounding up, which is not algebraic. And here's the theorem, which says that this projection of the set of f vectors of four-dimensional polytopes is not semi-algebraic. There's no way to describe this with finitely many algebraic conditions without such a rounding up. I think um, I will try and be short on proof techniques, but I want to at least um, sketch a little bit what we are doing there. And I'm trying to uh, sketch this in an example where I would say this is obviously not semi-algebraic. Namely, all the integer points um, which are where x, y, where y is larger equals um, 3 over 2 times cosine x. And I guess also um, y larger equals 1, you also want to have. At least in my picture, I only dot and dotted the ones which are y equals 1, uh, at least 1. But um, so you look at that and the question is, is this set of integer points semi-algebraic or not? And you stare at that for a while and you realize, well, there is this red line. And on this red line, we see that points are in the set and not in the set and in the set and not in the set. And since this alternates infinitely many, if this set S was um, semi-algebraic, then the set of um, black dots on the red line would also have to be semi-algebraic, and it's not. It's basically, that's the one-dimensional case. And that's the easy way to prove that this set is not semi-algebraic. The next higher thing would be that you say, if you go along an algebraic curve and not necessarily a line, let's say along a parabola, then again, a set of integer points, which along a parabola or some other algebraic curve uh, alternates infinitely many between it's in the set or it's not in the set, then it can't be semi-algebraic. That's what I would call the curve lemma. And you would try and solve the problems I've just sketched using the curve lemma and it shows up in the examples, that's not good enough. And then you need a little more. Um, so this is again an illustration of the curve lemma, where if we have infinitely often alternate between is in my set and is not in my set, then uh, the set of integer points is not algebraic. What we really need in the end is a strip lemma which really says um, the whole thing we play not only along a curve, but we really um, play that along arbitrarily thin strips. Um, why do you need that? Well, that's what you find from working hard on trying to do this along curves where it doesn't quite work. And that's where things get technical. And that's where I would skip this for a lecture like this. So there's the strip lemma, and that's then good enough to really prove things. And here's what we can prove. Now we go back to polytopes. And here's the G theorem, really, um, which, as I mentioned, is sort of the, I think, the biggest achievement of 20th century, um, 20th century um, um, polytope theory. Um, where what we would uh, describe with the McMullen correspondence, um, one of the really big theorems and first assessment would be, it looks like a um, semi-algebraic set. Is it really? And the answer is, well, not quite. Um, 
for dimension three, things are easy. Three-dimensional polytopes, actually, we've already done, but you can also do it for, for um, via the G theorem. And this is the effectors of simplicial three polytopes as semi-algebraic. Um, the same thing really um, works um, works for, um, um, sorry, I just have to recap one second. Uh, we are still in this, um, the set of um, G vectors is semi-algebraic. Um, and perhaps I should say one second what, uh, the, what the structure is of the G theorem. And the structure of the G theorem always says that there's a certain matrix. And um, the matrix says that all the effectors I get by combining rows of this matrix where certain conditions are on how I combine. And the result then in dimension three is the effectors of um, semi-algebraic sets are um, um, have this simple structure. Um, corollary G vectors for um, four dimension three is semi-algebraic. Now we do dimension four and we work out the details and it's much more complicated. And again, we find out the set is semi-algebraic. Um, dimension four. Um, in, um, I should just, uh, sorry, interrupt one second. I'm sorry, this was sort of interruption in home office <laughs> uh, as these things go. Um, so this is the, uh, the case of dimension four. Um, again, um, what do we get as a corollary? It says that the F vectors of four dimensional simplicial polytopes is a semi-algebraic set. And then we do dimension five. Um, and um, in dimension five, you see always the matrix gets larger. That's the so-called McMullen correspondence. The conditions get a bit more complicated, but they are still algebraic. And corollary, the F vectors of simplicial four-dimensional polytopes are semi-algebraic. And the proof is again the same thing as before. And now it sounds like we go on, and actually we don't. Here's dimension six. Dimension six, again, the matrix is a bit larger. Um, the conditions get a bit more complicated and that's how people write down these conditions and they hide some stuff that isn't semi-algebraic. Um, you can work it out. Uh, we don't want to do it in detail, but this here really, this condition says that you write things in terms of um, binomial coefficients and then uh, work from that and that gets more and more complicated. Let me again do a picture. And in the picture, you see that there's gaps and sort of bumps showing up. And the theorem in the end says that the set of pairs of certain G numbers of simplicial polytopes is not semi-algebraic. So in the end, again, I get it from a two-dimensional picture. It's really from analyzing this picture and what the conditions are and the strip lemma and the strip lemma proves that we don't do the details here and as a corollary you get from the g numbers the f numbers so the f vectors of six dimensional simplicial polytopes is not a semi-algebraic set and um, then the next corollary is that even if you take the f vectors of all polytopes in dimension six, this is not semi-algebraic. And the reason is basically that if this was semi-algebraic, then you could restrict to this hyperplane given by a linear equation, and that would also be semi-algebraic, and it isn't, because everything that satisfies this equation is simplicial. Now, that means we've answered this question 
are the sets of f vectors of d-dimensional polytope semi-algebraic? The answer is yes in dimension two and three. It's no in six and higher. And perhaps we would like to know um, what happens in between. And actually, I don't know, open problem. And with that, I would sort of go into some final thoughts and say where the open problems are. Um, so the big one for me is to prove that f of p4 is not semi-algebraic. Um, there's various other ways to rephrase this question, and one would be, can you really characterize the set in any case? Um, is it a polynomially decidable problem? I give you an f-vector, you tell me there is a polytope or not, which has this f-vector. We don't know that. So I told you one specific example would be 1,000, 10,000, 10,000, 1,000. Um, the second um, thing would be, even if it's not semi-algebraic, we want to describe it in some way, at least approximately. So you're allowed to round up. You're allowed to give me a simple algorithm to find out, given an f-vector, is it in there or not? Um, we don't know. Actually, we don't even know approximately. So approximately, you take all the f-vectors and you look at, you know, what cone do they span? What do the large f-vectors look like that are really correspond to four-dimensional polytopes? And in the end, it boils down that we don't really know what four-dimensional polytopes look like in general. Um, I would say three-dimensional polytopes we understand. That's actually due to Ernst Steinitz in the most important part. Four-dimensional polytopes we don't understand. Um, and here's a very specific question, um, namely, do you understand f vectors of four dimensional approximately, can this quotient be arbitrarily large? And with this example I've just shown you, this quotient would be roughly 10. Is this possible? Actually, we don't know. Can it be arbitrarily large? Can it be as large as 10? We don't know, um, just because we do not really understand the f vectors of four dimensional polytopes, even approximately. And this game of trying to understand them in terms of semi-algebraic integer sets is just one way to do it. Well, this was so negative. Um, let me try and also give a positive perspective. And the positive perspective would be that I would still believe that sets of f vectors have some structure. This is not just arbitrary. Uh, sets of integer points. Um, question is just what structure can you do? And so we go back to the first picture from the beginning. And the first picture from the beginning was this one, says basically that these um, integer points are really the integer points in a linear cone. And which means basically if you translate this to zero, then this just means sums of f vectors are again f vectors. So this has the structure of a semi-group. And you could ask, is this true in general? And here's the, what you could write down for f vectors of three-dimensional polytopes. So this is this shifting to zero. It just means that there is a certain addition can you, that you can define where this becomes an affine semi-group where just adding integer vectors gives you new f vectors. And um, here is a result, again a positive result. You can take the f vectors of simplicial polytopes, which we understand by the G theorem, and they also have the structure that you can define an addition and you get a semi group. So, in that sense, f vectors of simplicial polytopes can be added, and so the set of f vectors has a semi group structure, that's some structure. So the question, of course, is what happens for general polytopes? Um, simple, uh, simplicial polytopes and f vectors of simplicial polytopes are just much easier. And here the observation is that if you look at the four-dimensional polytopes, then at least you get an approximate affine semi-group. 
And you could say, well, I've never heard about it. Uh, what is this an approximate affine semi-group? And I would say, perhaps I'm not surprised you've never heard about it because I just defined it. An approximate semi-group would just mean that if I add two effectors, then, um, and here it should say f of p and f of q typo, then the result is at least close to an effector of a four polytope which means this approximately has the structure of an affine semigroup. And again, that's something I can prove. And how do I prove that? Well, I prove that because I can show that every polytope has a small facet or the dual has a small facet. So there's some work to be done in the combinatorics of polytopes. Um, Small means a, a facet that has much fewer faces than the polytope itself. And with this lemma, um, we can prove this theorem up there. But it's also true that this lemma is wrong for um, d-dimensional polytopes um, in higher dimensions. Um, I still don't know whether the theorem is true in higher dimensions, but uh, this proof um doesn't work in um, higher dimensions so there's something to be done so that's still open problems and i think with this open problem i would also um end my lecture thank you for your patience for listening in this format and i hope that i've generated lots of questions and perhaps even answer. thank you thank you professor for a great lecture uh, it's time for questions and co or comments. Please ask the question in no, QA or and... Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, it's time for the questions or comments. Uh, please ask the question in QA or raise hand for the questions, please. So, <clears throat> I don't know how to raise hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You can, you, you can ask questions. Okay, Professor Uchak. So, I have two questions. So the first question is about this um, semi-algebraic. So, so if we if we take d-dimensional polytope, uh, apparently this is a projection of semi-algebraic set of higher dimension into 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 space of the dimension d. What about the dimension of this super space? So it's it's enough to take semi-algebraic set in d plus one or two d or two to the d or whatever. So that's my first question. Oh, you have sorry, you need to switch off your 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 mic. I don't see. You are muted. Yeah. Okay. Now. Uh, okay. Thanks for your question. So the question was. Um, we know that the f vectors of d-dimensional polytopes is a projection of a semi-algebraic set of integer points. What's in what dimension do we have to go? So there's very um, general problems, uh, general results in the connection of Hilbert's tenth problem, which say dimension d plus nine, I think, is okay. Um, so you don't need many more. Um, um, many more dimensions. And the reason is that there's a theorem that says that anything that's a projection of a Diophantine set of some higher dimension is also a projection of a Diophantine set in dimension uh, d plus nine. Um, yes. We have, of course, we and that's sort of a, a theoretical result and we have no idea how um, how this higher dimensional set would really look like or the description of that set. Um, theoretically, that can be worked out. And then you have a huge system of polynomials and don't see anything. So um, it would really be interesting to understand that. And um, But is it, is, it, is it possible to prove that, say, it cannot be d plus 1 always? Um, good question. 
Because you said that in, uh, in the dimension five, it's mm -hmm. yeah. So my second question, if I if I may, mm -hmm. so what do you know about the structure of this uh, uh, of of this uh, in in general in the high dimension, like larger than six? So, for instance, is it clear that if you have if you have this this set of integers, or maybe any projection of this set, that this projection does not contain um, unbounded holes. So uh, I wouldn't like to 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 describe it, but I think it's uh, it's obvious what I mean. So so I would like to have the the some sort of domain which is which is surrounded by these integer points. And is it true that uh, it is clear? Is it clear that uh, such a such a hole? Maybe there are some few finite exception, exceptions, or maybe there are some sort of infinite of infinite set of holes which are say with even parity mm -hmm. and so on. But is it true that uh, you cannot have this unbounded holes in one of the projections, or maybe on in the uh, in the in the polytope itself? Yeah. So, in if we look at simplicial polytopes, then we have very good answers for that. And uh, there's like this picture I showed, where at the boundary it's wiggly, but the wiggly boundary yeah. can be described, and that's a good answer. And it doesn't the set doesn't. So it has these holes which come from this wiggly boundary, which come from these uh, binomial coefficient things, but there's no somehow big unexpected holes in there. For general polytopes, um, I would also think that, but I cannot prove that. And this is exactly this, uh, this attempt from trying to find a semi-group structure. And if I could say that, um, that uh, a sum of two f vectors is approximately again an f vector then you could say approximately so for very large polytopes um the set of all f vectors is convex yes uh, yes yes i understand if you if you have this uh, this uh, uniform uh, bound for the this uh, approximate it it follows i agree but uh, is it possible to prove it for general d yeah I because I mean, okay, so well, let me ask a much weaker question. Yeah. Is it true that this set has only one end? I mean, every projection, if you if you take the cone, it cannot you you know split into two. Yeah. So this was now very hard to understand for me because there was some sound problem. Oh, I'm sorry. So let me just uh, repeat. So. Is it true? So it is much weaker question, and I think it's it's probably uh, of affirmative yes. So it is possible to prove that in any projection, if you have this cone, it has only one end, like uh, one end in the infinite graph. So so for instance, in 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 the plane, there will be not two cones, infinite cones, which are not connected. So it is much weaker question, of course, because there is an infinite hole in it among these two rays. But but is it possible to prove it easily? Or? Now you uh, have you need to see that you are mute, muted. So sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, so my answer is no. It cannot be proved easily. Because the easy way for me would exactly be this taking convex combinations. And that means you have to glue together polytopes. And if I want to glue together polytopes, then I have to do, and if this is not supposed to mess up the effect or completely, then I have to glue together along small facets. And four dimensional polytopes always have four and small facets. And so I can do that and higher dimensional it may be true, but I think it's not so easy to prove. So the reason in dimension four is a graph theoretic thing uh, that you, of course, are familiar with because you're a graph theorist, which is basically the fact that the bipartite graph, which doesn't contain a K33, can only have a limited number of edges. That's what's in there. And in 
five-dimensional polytopes are higher, the graph between vertices and facets uh, can have K3-3s in there, and, and there's no bound that helps us there. And that's really where the problem comes from. That's why the simple proof doesn't work. But it doesn't mean the whole thing is wrong. Um, but uh, in the moment, I don't know how to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there's uh, time for some more questions. For clarification, the right hand icon is in the lower right corner of the chat. Uh, so, uh, please, there, there are any questions, comments? So again, uh, it's I possible. All, uh, yes, I, 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 I can see any, uh, anyone. It's also possible to to write a question in the chat if if some someone prefer this this way. Oh, here's the uh, uh, Mr. Grzegorz. I'll give you the mic. mic. Please ask the question. Uh, uh, Professor Banaszak is asking, uh, I will give you the mic, or please, please, uh, to give the mic to the Professor Grzegorz Banaszak. Professor Banasha, you, you can speak. As the mic, mic is, is off, so maybe there are some technical problems. Oh yeah, we can we can see professor, but we we, we can't hear you. You you should uh, uh, turn microphone on. Is possible for you to you? There is the icon of, of the mic on on the lower lower part. I understand. Yes. Oh yeah. Now yes. now now. Sorry, now. I, it was first time for me with this tool. It's quite. It, it took me all. For a few pages around. Okay, um, I have a question to Professor Ziegler. Um, so, uh, from if you do not, uh, I mean, if you only work without inequalities, just uh, strictly with equalities, uh, semi-algebraic, then I guess it is a pure algebraic geometry, right? I mean, this is uh, much simpler. So, if you um, if you allow only one equality or, sorry, or two inequalities in your um, so kind of <laughs> starting like a child from building up uh, the difficult of a problem would would you have some control on the semi-algebraic uh, sets uh, development hmm. um good question so uh, first thing is uh, as i said i mean i have not found any uh, substantial literature on uh, this concept of um of the integer points in a semi-algebraic set, although I think this is uh, this is a very natural uh, concept which comes up there, and that also means I have not found studies of that sort of thing. And I think there's various ways to somehow build up the complexity that you try and understand uh, what can describe with a limited number of conditions, and and that should be worked out and. For me, the approach was to, on the one hand, uh, try and understand this concept, um, but really uh, use these these problems from geometry as a testing ground. And that's also how I came up with this concept, as to saying it looks like the answers are simple to these problems coming from geometry. Yes, um, I was. Uh, yeah, I was uh, thinking. Uh, so, of course, starting with only 
equalities. Uh, we have, of course, Hilbert basis theorem, but uh, no problem. Of course, uh, problem, big problem. <laughs> we cannot have any sort of like this Hilbert Nullstrom ensemble. Of course, <laughs> it's Hilbert Nullstrom This is uh, this is what we don't have anything like this in this case. So I was thinking that. Um, uh, uh, this, what I asked, but maybe adding only one inequality. Uh, can you can you hear me, Ginter? Can you hear? Me? Yes, you can. Go. Okay, uh, would be easier to, to consider to consider. You know, this, because you are looking for a bounds that come, of course, from the inequalities. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in higher dimension, uh, I was wondering if you have just the same algebraic set uh, uh, described by number of equalities and only one inequality. <laughs> And then two inequalities, etc. So, so it might be might be possible to describe something more general about like with one inequality. That's just yeah. okay. Cross my mind just looking. Thank you for your lecture. It was very interesting to listen to. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense, and it gives another grading on how complicated things are. And of okay, course, yeah. in real geometry, you can always put all the equations into one by just yeah, sure. taking sums of uh, of squares. Mm -hmm. But you cannot combine inequalities in that sense. So that gives you a measure mm -hmm. of complexity. Yeah. Okay. okay I think we have uh, time for one more one two questions. Please. Uh, Raise a hand on right or write the uh, uh, in the chat the question. Uh, Professor Banasha, would you like to ask another question, or is the uh, 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 last icon from from the last question? Sorry, I just forgot to. to <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. I'm sorry. So th there are any more questions? Okay, if, if not, uh, thank you, Professor, for once more for the great lecture and uh, very interesting. And I hope that the next meeting uh, will take the place in real life and we will have some cup of tea or, or coffee and we can discuss possibilities for uh, uh, research cooperation of, of our institution. Uh, thank you once more. Uh, be before we end, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jaworski uh, for all job done, uh, for preparation of today event and many years work to put into organization of such excellent series of lectures. Jurku, thank you very much. Uh, it's time to close lecture. Thank you for all, all for participation. Goodbye. Thank you. Yes, clap the hands for, for the good lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. And um, I'm happy that this worked out so nicely over, over the web. And let's stay connected. Let's uh, take that also as a motto for all of us. Um, including everybody uh, in the audience um, that in these times where we try and isolate people because of the um, pandemic um, mathematicians and computer scientists uh, should really stick together and stay connected and let's take this as as uh, one instance of this today thank you very much yeah, that's right thank you thanks goodbye bye bye <laughs>